Viewer discretion is advised, details can be found in the description. In the old times, there was a show called Brickleberry that was bad. So of course Netflix wanted in on it. They commissioned the show's creators, Roger Black and Wei Kuo Gwen, to create what ended up being a near exact clone of Brickleberry, only this time with the Netflix original logo on it. Paradise PD, as it would become known in the legends, didn't have an original bone in its body, borrowing not only Brickleberry's writing style, but also many of its characters, performances, jokes, and episode storylines. In this video though, we're not going to be focusing on either of those shows. Instead, we're going to be focusing on Roger and Waco's third adult animated comedy, a show called This is Farza. Long before Paradise PD's final season had even been announced, it was made public that Black and O'Gwen had been given another show by Netflix for some reason. But with Brickleberry and Brickleberry 2 Brickleharder collectively having six seasons under their belts, not to mention the fact that at that time Paradise PD was still going, it was obviously time for something new. Farza is a sci-fi epic set on the planet Farza, a planet that aliens and humans are battling for control of. The first thing you'll notice is that that tired generic Family Guy art style of the previous two shows has been replaced with a style clearly parodying styles that were popular in the 80s. The show actually communicates a part of its own unique identity through its visuals, imagine that. You'll also have noticed our new main character, warrior hero Renzo, who... God damn it, he's marrying an old woman. It's just gonna be Brickleberry again, isn't it? Well, at least we have a distinct new premise and distinct new art style for the first three minutes of the show. After that, it cuts to the most generic Family Guy style animation you could imagine and introduces our main cast, a misfit team of law enforcers, each of which has several stupid character gimmicks. They're called the Shat Squad because of course they are. With Brickleberry and Brickleberry 2 Brickleharder collectively having six seasons under their belts, not to mention the fact that at that time Paradise PD was still going, it was obviously time for something new. Guys. First things first, let's actually address that art style, shall we? It's the same animated style as the last two shows, so where did you guys come up with that? Back at Brickleberry, just trying to get something that if you saw a character, you would know it was, it was ours. What? In this interview, Waco Gwen lists three things that he thinks give his and Roger's characters a distinctive visual flair. Number one, a three in the ear. Yeah, all the way from Brickleberry to Farzar, everybody's ears have threes in them. This isn't actually something I noticed throughout the seven seasons of animated content I watched for this video. Oh god. And let's be honest, it's not something you noticed either when you were watching parts one and two of this series, but it does act as a very subtle little signature on all of these incredibly generic looking characters. Number two, Mouths that don't move off the edge of the face. The mouth not moving off the face. This one is pretty weird because while some animated shows have a style in which the mouth protrudes off the edge of the face, that is by no means the default. In fact, every generic adult animated comedy I've covered on this channel has a style in which the mouth doesn't protrude off the edge of the face. So what Ogwin is describing here may be an aspect of the animation style they use, but it's by no means something that makes it distinctive. He may as well just say, our art style is distinctive because all our human characters have human skin tones. Number three, separate eyes. When he was asked how he came up with this art style, considering how self-aware these guys seem to think they are, I'm surprised he didn't just say, yeah, we watched Family Guy. It's one thing to use this art style, but if you're gonna give me a list of reasons you think it's distinctive, then come on now. If we move on to the characters, the Shat Squad answers to Renzo, who exactly like the main characters of the previous two shows is strict, stubborn, self-interested, and speaks his mind. This is my bullshit meter. Your job? is to keep it on the level. Oh, hell no. We really need to talk about alien rights. Uh-oh, Fico. You just took us to bullshit level. Don't make me take off my goddamn belt. Hey, they didn't get Tom Kenny to voice him this time. That's kind of like coming up with a new character. We then have Renzo's son, Fikel. Now, you may assume that Fikel is Renzo's step or adopted son, and that's why he's not black or mixed race, but no, they just... Forgot. Fikel fills a familiar character archetype as well. Today is the day you die. Ah! Anyway, today is the day. Ah! He's the show's dweeby dumbass loser. You are a good guy, Fikel. Gross. 
If you pork this dork, you better stay on your side of the vagina. That won't be a problem. I have a shockingly slender penis. It's been 10 years since Brickleberry! Fucking come up with something else! We are now three for three on all of these shows having the same two main characters. In two out of three, the dweeby loser is the strict boss's son. And in all three, the dweeb has a small deformed penis, because how else would you write comedy? We then also have Scooty, who I'm just gonna be calling Robot Denzel, because, like... Yeah. I'll let you wear my astronaut suit. He is also just an overt reskate of a Brickleberry character. Robot Denzel used to be a fully fleshy human, but after going on several missions where he lost a body part on each one, he now only has one human body part left. Which is, of course, the funny body part, his dick. There's no way I'm going on this mission. The only human part of me left is my man part. And I don't want to lose that. The first episode then sees him going on a mission where he's very careful not to lose his dick the whole time, and he manages to keep it right until the end of the episode, until randomly we cut to him loudly announcing how happy he is he still has it. I did it! I made it back without losing my last human part! Why did they decide to take comedy aimed at four-year-olds and then make it inaccessible to four-year-olds by making it all about penises? The only real difference between Denzel and Robot Denzel, apart from all the robot stuff, is that Robot Denzel doesn't like having sex with old people. They've shuffled some of the traits around again, and in this show, the old people sex jokes go to Renzo and his wife, the Queen, who is old, horny, and basically just Hobson from Paradise PD. Twerk them tits. Oh, yes, come on. You know what mummy likes. Hey man, I know I haven't used this platform to contact you since the debate stream we did, but honest to god, I think you'd really like three shows called Brickleberry, Paradise PD, and Faza. You should check them out. Then of course, because Faza is one of these shows, we have the character who exists primarily to be mocked for being gross or ugly or unappealing. While in Brickleberry jokes were often made calling Connie an affront to nature, in Faza we have an actual affront to nature. Billy is Faza's closest equivalent to Connie or Dusty from the previous two shows. Billy must go, so no put friends in danger. Billy, wait! We ain't your friends, you Noah's Ark looking motherfucker. We aren't your friends, you Noah's Ark looking mother. Really? I guess because Billy is made of animal parts and Noah's Ark had animals in it? That's the strength of the connection we're working with here, guys. Help to prove Zobo is chaos a lot. And why would I help you, you Noah's Ark looking asshole? No, they used it again! We did that one already? We're already running out of these? Oh boy. It's gonna be a long season. If you're too lazy to come up with a joke, but then point out that you're lazy, that means you're not lazy anymore. Now being lazy is funny and clever. It would be dishonest of me to say that Billy was a recycled character. While he does get used as a punching bag in a somewhat similar way, his character traits and gimmicks aren't that similar to Connie or Dusty. On the other hand though, he is the perfect example of the attitudes and approach that gave us Connie and Dusty in the first place. And if you recall, Dusty wasn't just a clone of Connie either. All three of these characters though fulfill the same role in their respective shows. We also have Billy's creator, a scientist called Barry who is kind of like the Doctors from the previous two shows, but he's been turned up to 11. Besides being a scientist, his whole thing is being into weird sex stuff. What's the plan? I'll shrink you down with this, shove you up my ass, then shrink myself down, shove myself up his ass. We go all around the table until we're one big Russian nesting doll. How does this help get my son back? Oh, we're still doing that? And being severely mentally ill. Barry's weird comments make him seem insane. All those nervous breakdowns must have damaged his brain. Is there anyone else hearing that voice? And hey, you know what? I think there's a chance these two might be gimmick characters as well. Guess what? They're recycled. In Paradise PD, there are a couple of side characters who appear in two episodes of series one. The whole thing they bring to the show is that they're conjoined twins, but one of them is a cop and the other is a dancer. Well, at least when you're cops, you can be your own partner. I don't want to be a cop. I, sir, am a dancer. I'd assumed that these characters only appear in two episodes of the show because even Black and O'Gwyn realize that this gimmick will wear thin incredibly quickly. But no, apparently not, because in Faza, here's the same recycled gimmick, but attached to a pair of main characters. Mal Skullcruncher? Reporting for duty, sir. Val Skullcruncher. 
Present! My preschool class calls me Ms. Skull Cruncher. This bit wasn't worth doing the first time, guys. Kids, today we are doing an educational field trip with my sister. We've got to do something quick. Oh, uh, quickly. It's an adverb. Shut the fuck up, Val! Yeah, man. This sure doesn't get old. Just like with the leap from Brickleberry to Paradise PD, you're supposed to notice some of the things they've borrowed from their previous show. In fact, Farzar is packed with overt references to Brickleberry and Paradise PD. <laughs> The kingpin. Of course, in keeping with what is now a 20-year-old tradition of including this character in every show they make, Bobby Possum Cods is back in his newest legally distinct form. You better hide behind that cloud, you big R son of a bitch. But we also get a few other surprise cameos. And I found another pussy. <laughs> I'm in both shows now! I think you mean all three, bestie. This character is played by John DiMaggio, by the way. Of course, since Farza and Paradise PD are both Netflix shows, Paradise PD characters can show up in Farza if the writers want. Like, in episode 4, Renzo is trying to clone himself, but he keeps getting the procedure wrong, and one of the failed attempts produces Agent Clappers, the Paradise PD character voiced by Renzo's voice actor. I think I got it right this time. Bing, bang, boom, dick titties. I am Agent Clappers. Which is a pretty cute way to include the reference, to be honest. Although, once any Paradise PD character arrives, the only joke they tell with them is just to have them go, Hello, look at me, I am in the show now. Look at me, I am in the show. But then, besides the deliberate references, the rest of the show is obviously made of reused content as well. Farza isn't just a show composed of all the same tropes as the last two. It's not just a show that uses the same characters with the same dynamics between them to tell exactly the same kind of jokes as the last two shows. That was your plan? the whole time. Oh, hey, Fico, I didn't realize that you were still alive. It also just straight up reuses jokes from both Brickleberry. I remember it like it happened 15 years ago. Steve? Oh, sorry. I thought you guys could see my brain movie. I'm picturing something like this. How many times we gotta tell you we can't see your goddamn thoughts? And from Paradise PD. He's dead. Paul fella came and went at the same time. If an intellectoid orgasms, we explode and die. Basically, if we come, we go. Netflix, if they fool you once, shame on them. If they fool you twice, poo. Are you gonna let them sell you the same thing a third time? Because if you do, I will just laugh. Because genuinely, it is quite funny watching these same two guys collect check after check from Netflix for resubmitting the same script over and over again. The whole town knows you're screwing your goddamn car. Come on, I don't think that many people saw that press conference. Hey, everybody, it's the car fucker! I made a fool of myself and became a dragon's butt plug. Don't worry, master. I'm sure everyone's forgotten about that. Hey, look! It's the dragon's butt plug! I'll never forget that! I mean, I wouldn't have paid for this script the first time. Of course, it has been 10 years now since Brickleberry Series 1, and things haven't stayed exactly the same that whole time. In fact, from Series 1 of Brickleberry all the way to Farza, there has been a consistent power creep. From the very start, Brickleberry was an edgy and raunchy show with plenty of shock humor in it. But, particularly in season one, the pacing was slow enough to give its stories time to breathe. A lot of the jokes were grounded and actually based in character interaction, and some of the time, they kinda worked. Craig's list. Now what? Okay, first things first, you don't wanna hire a child. So click on the adults only section. Adults only. Good thinking. Hyper absurdist elements were used somewhat sparingly, meaning when they actually did pop up, they had the potential to surprise the viewer by breaking away from the established norm. All of this was slowly lost from one season to the next. Over the course of the previous decade, Black and O'Gwen's characters have become even more caricatured and gimmick oriented than they were initially, and that is saying a lot. I think the nature of this slow, steady change is exemplified perfectly by the Russian cartel boss who appeared both in Brickleberry and in Paradise PD. In Brickleberry, he was an exaggerated caricature of a trope archetype. Most of the jokes made about him played off of how aggressive and scary he was, although there were some other ones mixed in there as well. In Paradise PD, though, he's given a new cheap crutch to depend upon for comedy. He doesn't just speak like the Count, he speaks like the Count in every scene he appears in, 
which totally never gets old. One gigantic penis! Ah. Over time, these character gimmicks have become more frequent, exaggerated, and openly absurd, and characters with extreme gimmicks have been given more screen time. In Farza, Mal and Val Skullcruncher are main characters. Robot Denzel isn't just a robot version of Denzel, he has loads of gimmicks. For example, the robot schlong he gets after episode one is really silly, huge, and exaggerated and he whips it out all the time. He also has a little mutant guy who lives on his ass. Little Ass Man exists mainly to make crass comments and break the fourth wall because we desperately needed more characters to do both of those things. That's right, it's me. Fan favorite breakout character, Sal. These gimmicks are clearly much further removed from reality than, say, the gimmicks you found in Brickleberry, and that's not just a result of Farzar's sci fi setting. It's certainly facilitated and justified by the sci fi setting, but absurdist elements like this have been getting more and more common since day one. Paradise PD Series 1 featured mostly human characters, with one talking dog thrown in there because how else would you know it was one of Family Guy's consequences? Then, throughout the seasons, more and more attention was given to these weird mutant characters who are used mostly for gross-out comedy. Then Faza comes along with its sci-fi premise and suddenly they don't even have to justify the existence of these weird creatures anymore and instantly introduce a race of people literally made of shit. Scenes in series one of Brickleberry weren't funny, but at least they had time to breathe. Scenes in Faza tend to go more like, hey look, a character gimmick. Hey look, a guy made of poo. Hey look, the guy made of poo exploded and now everyone is covered in poo. Suckle that, you little shit. Uh, oh, stop it, Mal. I'm big, Bob Dookie. Have y'all seen my boy around here? Scooty was already covered in poo because this was the second time this scene Scooty got covered in poo. Billy scared! Oh, shit! Also, when Big Bob Dookie said, have y'all seen my boy around here, that was a reference to an earlier scene in which Feichel got covered in poo. The shock humor in early Brickleberry would often slowly escalate. The show's second episode, for example, sees Denzel meet, seduce, and then sleep with an old woman. Then he finds out her mother is still alive, and because she's even older, he tries to sleep with her instead. And he does. Eventually, all three of them end up in bed together, and during the threesome, they both die. It starts out with a level of gross-out shock humor, and then naturally progresses until its peak. This steady escalation, at least in theory, allows every new joke to be shocking because it goes slightly further than the previous one. You're not just watching random edgy things happen for no reason, you're watching an extreme situation slowly develop. If all that mattered in shock humor was just being as gross as possible, then surely the episode would be way funnier if it started out with two old women dying in a threesome with Denzel and then maintained that level of, um, zaniness for the rest of the story. But it wouldn't be, and I can only assume that's why they didn't do it at first. By the time we get to Faza, any semblance of this rising action or structure is completely gone. Take episode six, where the family of the queen, Renzo's wife, come to visit. It's immediately revealed that this family never procreates with any one from outside the family, and they're all extremely inbred, which is, of course, very wacky. We have a long, proud tradition of inbreeding. They then turn everything up to 11 off the bat, stuffing this entire plotline with extreme gross-out jokes from start to finish. The scenes are filled with characters just saying or doing things that are clearly supposed to be as shocking as possible. Bear with me for a moment. Let's go back to Fresh Meat. One of the show's characters, JP, is a posh guy who's very used to getting everything he he wants. What kind of a lesbian kiss is that? What do I get out of it? This is why in series three, when a girl he really likes rejects him, he takes it incredibly poorly. The girl he likes, Sam, gets along pretty well with Kingsley, and because of this, JP views Kingsley as a romantic rival. He starts lashing out at Kingsley, and all of this culminates in a scene where they're both pretty drunk after a party, and JP does this. Calm down. JP, put down the bread knife. Okay, I will put down the bread knife. Watch! Now, out of context, I don't really think this is that funny, but with the context of having watched the previous three seasons of the show, it fucking kills. Fresh Meat is a show about realistic, well-rounded characters in a world where actions have consequences. The characters react realistically to the consequences, and that's often even a source of comedy. Just because I've locked myself in the bathroom, you know, that doesn't mean anything. Then come out. No, thank you. That means that in this moment, it really does feel like a line has actually been crossed. The thing that JP just did 
could have killed Kingsley. Even though the knife didn't actually hit him, the fact that JP did that in the first place is obviously gonna have repercussions. This isn't just a throwaway joke. The writers are actually committing to something here, and the audience understands that. This isn't the type of thing people typically think of when you talk about shock comedy, but a huge aspect of why it's funny is the shock. And that shock is only possible because it crosses a line you're not expecting it to. When Farzar does its 26th extreme gross out moment with the inbred people, it's not committing to anything or crossing any lines it hasn't crossed before in that episode. Why should I care about any of this enough to laugh at it? All of it's happening to caricature characters who just exist to dispense gimmicks. I know there won't be consequences to any of it because you don't do consequences in these shows. You had Malloy shoot Steve to death, the next episode he's just back and no one ever mentions it again. By the time we get to Faza, there is absolutely no telling what'll stick. In episode 2, there's a joke where Robot Denzel gets his face painted at an inappropriate time. We're getting the hell out of this death trap. I kinda like it here. But then, it cuts away from him and cuts back and his face is just back to normal. Were the consequences of Denzel getting his face painted too much for you to deal with, guys? And if you don't want to do a show with consequences or realistic characters, then that's absolutely fine. But you're gonna need to give me more to laugh at than, hey, look, an inbred person drinking another inbred person's bodily fluids. And when I say give me something more to laugh at, I do not mean power creep to something even grosser. That's not what's missing here, I promise. And if you thought we were done with the power creep, we are not. There's one other thing that's been slowly creeping up in power level over the last 10 years as well, and that is the laziness. Brickleberry may have been an extremely lazy show, but at the very least they bothered to keep track of what shape Steve's penis was. What could I possibly mean by that? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Despite the fact that the initial joke they make about Feichel's penis is that it's shockingly slender. I have a shockingly slender penis. A few episodes later, they actually show it and it's really short and wide and they make jokes about it being short and wide. They couldn't even be bothered to keep track of the type of deformed penis they gave this punching bag. <laughs> Oh hey Robot Denzel! It looks like you have a vagina with balls! The jokes in Faza find new and inventive ways to be lazy and shit. If we stick to the episode about the inbred family, because I'm sure you all just desperately want to hear more about that, there's a joke about Feichel having to participate in something called a seating ceremony. I am so excited for my seating ceremony! Which he is absolutely pumped for despite the fact he doesn't know what it is. But what is a royal seating ceremony? I'm picturing something like this. I'm sure that's gonna go well for him. Well, the joke is that he'd actually misunderstood the name of the ceremony the whole time. What do I get to sit on? Not seating. Seeding. You're going to impregnate all of your cousins. He continues to describe the ceremony in great detail. As much as this joke is just another excuse for more extreme gross-out humor, it should have been really easy to set up. The vast majority of Farzar's characters speak with American accents and therefore pronounce seeding and seating exactly the same way. Seeding ceremony. I am sure the fact that these words both sound the same in an American accent is what the American writers had in mind when they wrote this misunderstanding. So, all the writers would have to do to properly set up this joke would be have Feichel hear about the ceremony from Renzo, or Mal, or Val, or Barry, or Scooty, and not literally the only English member of the main cast. It's the day of your royal seating ceremony. She clearly said seating. I heard her. You're not fooling me. So yeah, Brickleberry may have sucked, but the throwaway jokes didn't have fucking plot holes. Well, at least not ones this big. So that's Faza, the same show again, but with a new lick of paint. Again. Gold plated puppy. I know we're rich, but I'd prefer a living pet. What's next? A gold plated girlfriend? <laughs> no. Get the fuck out of here. But this time it's after 10 years of steady decline. Though, now we've covered everything up until the present, it seems only fitting we should take a brief look into the future. We still have Paradise PD Season 4 to look forward to, of course. Don't bash it before you've seen it. You need to go into it with a fully open mind. Beyond that, it's not clear whether Farzar will get a Season 2, or if Black and O'Gwen will get a fourth chance to make Brickleberry again. For one thing, Farzar is the first of their projects where the trailer has had an extremely poor reception. But, on the other hand, the show is currently beating Paradise PD's 48% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, 
with a whopping 52. Ultimately though, it's pretty difficult to predict. Understandably, we the public aren't supposed to know what metrics Netflix uses behind the scenes to determine whether or not they're gonna renew a show. And on top of that, even if I did know what those metrics were, I almost certainly wouldn't know how many people actually did watch all 10 episodes by July 24th, 2022. Several of the Brickleberry social media pages are very much still active. One of these pages is their Instagram, which as well as sharing moments from their shows and memes and fan arts and people with Malloy tattoos who I'm sure are just lovely, they posted, and sometime later then deleted, this. Huh? An image telling fans that if they want a triple crossover between Brickleberry, Paradise PD, and Faza to, one, spread the word about Faza, which I guess they're allowed to post if they want, but it does come across a little desperate, Chief. Two, watch all ten episodes of the show by July 24th. Now, they haven't stated explicitly that that's a metric by which Netflix determines the success of a show, but it seems oddly specific, doesn't it? Three, go to IMDb and give Faza a review, which is something I imagine they're allowed to ask people. Probably, but given the fact this is a Brickleberry fan page, most of those reviews are probably going to be pretty positive, skewing the show's score in its favour. Of course, this could be anything, but it sure does look like they're asking their fans to go and artificially inflate the metrics by which Netflix determines whether or not they're going to renew the show for season two. So... I guess we'll just have to wait for the next Netflix announcement to see if that strategy pays off for them. And hey, if it does, I'm sure, as promised, we'll receive a three-way crossover between all of the shows. Now, before I end the video, there is one thing I would like to acknowledge. There are people who find these shows really funny. People who will passionately defend Black and O'Gwyn's work until none of the other commuters are willing to sit next to them anymore. In the spirit of this video, I decided to borrow that joke from a video I made a year ago. These shows have fans. Paradise PD is that show that you have belly laugh moments, but the thing is, it's like, I'm in a belly laugh, like can't catch my breath laughing, and then you hit with two or three more belly laughs, oh, yeah, where you like, just go, God, yeah, hang on. And even if you just tumbled. had five of those belly laughs, you'd have a hit show, but then you just pile on and watching it, you don't get a break from laughing. I want to start by saying that I saw the Archer episode yesterday, and this was way, way better. So. What? No! I'm actually intensely curious about going to a Brickleberry Comic Con panel like this. Don't worry, I'll shit my pants to cover the smell. They're Laughter is just as real and genuine as when I laugh at something I find funny, and that's just something I'm gonna have to learn to accept, because ultimately, it's not within my power to help them. I say that as a joke, but in all seriousness, some of this show's fans really need some help, particularly the ones who have shown up in my comment section to leave complaints, and I can't think of a better way to close off this series. That's right, look away now, Denims, it's time for us to respond to some YouTube comments. Specifically, ones that were left under my original Paradise PD video from 2020. Now, before we get into it, you should know that there is one very common pattern within the angry ones. One particular form of argument that while I'm sure that not everyone who enjoys these shows subscribes to it, comes up over and over and over and over again. But what is it, you ask? Uh, why so many gaping pussies? Nothing wrong with a bit of shot comedy. It's about time with all these I'm a limp dicked, I need a safe space, beat a meal, soy drinking cuckolds. You were all c Get over yourselves. Fucking bunch of Fuck. Fucking bunch of keep. <laughs> JXE is so damn cringeworthy in these videos. It's pathetic. Typical oversensitive political correctness advocate that can't chill out and watch a funny show. Let's break it down and see what isn't funny, is offensive, or makes my pussy hurt. You're pathetic. <laughs> you sound like an SJW that gets pissed at everything. This show was funny AF. Offended ass pussy. You guys are just a bunch of snowflakes. Time to get rid or this beta males channel for the easily offended. Lol. Sir, if you're gonna insult me, at least be grammatically correct about it. Ultimate SJW snowflake cesspool. XD. Video plus comments. Weak ass snowflake. Lol. Hey, wait a minute, this is the same guy from last time. Oh my god, they strung a sentence together. Huzzah. These comments and more are the kind of manliness you can expect from El Macho. I think most people hate it because it's too edgy for those libtards. The funniest part of all of this is the fact that so many of you snowflakes are so mad at it. 69. Fart. Pee pee poo poo. See? 
I can post a bunch of BS on YouTube too. That BS is literally just the gist of the content you're defending. Y'all sound like some triggered bitches. Shit's fucking hilarious. This show is hilarious. Sorry, Snowflake. I can't wait for your stellar review on how awesome Snowflake and Safe Space are. XD. Oh man, that's a blast from the past. Do you remember Snowflake and Safe Space? The teen Marvel superheroes who tried to reclaim derogatory terms they got called online by making them their superhero names? Man, that'd be like if I named my YouTube channel Tr- Yeah, those are the two options. Think Paradise PD is good, or think Snowflake and Safe Space are good. Which way, Western man? To find this show unfunny, you probably don't have a good taste in humor. Or you're a snowflake. Yeah, so you've probably noticed the pattern by now. This is the only common argument. Politically motivated stuff, like, um... Ooh, you know whose voice I want to hear this one in? You're a sad little soy-consuming clown. This is a funny show. Clowns like you probably find woke comedy funny. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear to anyone who's betrayed me by not watching literally all of my YouTube videos that in my Paradise PD video, I never complain that the show is too offensive. That kind of thing isn't something I really had any interest at all in discussing. Instead, I spend the whole time going over the construction and repetitiveness of the jokes. I am impressed at how clean you keep this floor. It would be a real shame if it got messed up somehow. <laughs> well, how to do? Boy, I sure hope the health inspector don't show up. I just say that's not funny and loads of people rock up like- Wow, it's like some PC-obsessed nagging chick wrote this wreck of a review. Seems to me that you have a problem comprehending fast-delivered humor. Try watching it slow down or something. Like, really? I'm just too woke, stupid, and sensitive to understand the comedy genius on display in clips like this. This stuff is explosive, so drive carefully. Save three seconds by taking unfinished dangerous pothole road on left. All right then. <laughs> You see, the fact that you don't find that funny is proof that you don't subscribe to my conservative ideology. I'm making myself look really good here. Like, I can't begin to stress that I just don't talk about the things these people are complaining about. I talk about the fact that the show is full of content like this. I will be personally executing Dusty Marlowe in the electric chair. I don't know if you've heard, but the mayor is planning to- I know! She's gonna execute me! Oh my god! I always wanted a makeover! Why aren't you laughing? Are you offended? Thank you for joining me on this journey through Brickleberry, Paradise PD, and Faza. If you've enjoyed this video, good. I miss you.